Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and welcome to APE's video notes for topic 7.5, which is indoor air pollutants. Our objective for the day is to be able to identify indoor air pollutants, and the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will be explaining trends and data in order to draw a conclusion. So we'll start out today by talking about how sources of indoor air pollution differ in developing nations versus developed nations. So remember from our energy unit that in developing nations, there's much more reliance on what are called subsistence fuels. Remember, subsistence fuels are things like wood, charcoal, dried plant matter, or animal manure that can be really easily gathered by residents. And so this is beneficial economically because it's really cheap or maybe even free if they're taking it you know, from the nearby ecosystem. But a lot of air pollutants are released when these materials are combusted. So those air pollutants would uh, include carbon monoxide, particulate matter, NOx, and volatile organic compounds. And this is especially problematic because a lot of times these subsistence fuels are combusted indoors. So we have a little picture here to help us remember that a lot of times, whether it's cooking meals or heating the home, these fires are built indoors with poor ventilation. And that's gonna lead to buildup of really toxic and deadly concentrations of these air pollutants in people's homes. It's estimated that about 3 billion people globally cook with subsistence fuels or use subsistence fuels for heating. And this is uh, a leading cause of death globally, actually. It's either the second or third leading cause of death when you look at different analyses of this. And so estimates have ranged from 3.5 to 4.3 million deaths annually from the combustion of biomass fuels. And so it's a really important human health consequence that we need to understand. If we look at developed nations, we're going to rely more heavily on commercial fuels. And so these are things like natural gas, which you purchase from utility. And so they're typically combusted in furnaces or other you know, burning methods that have pretty airtight conditions where the ventilation you know, carries these fumes outside. They don't build up in the home typically. And so that means that in developing nations, we have different sources of air pollutants. And those would be primarily industrial chemicals. So these are things like cleaners or deodorizers like Febreze. It could even come from paint if you're in an old home that still has lead in the paint. And so the main air source, uh, or the main indoor air pollutants are gonna be very different in developing and developed nations. Again, in developing nations, they're gonna come more from the combustion of biomass fuels indoors, whereas in developed nations, they're gonna come more from the industrial products that we fill our homes with. Next, we'll take a look at particulate matter and a specific particle called asbestos. So remember that particulates are just little bits of suspended solids in the air. And when we're talking about indoor air pollutants, these are going to be primarily smoke. And so this could be from you know, combustion of biomass indoors for cooking or heating, as we talked about in developing nations. In more developed nations, it's oftentimes things like cigarette smoke, uh, but it could even just be dust. And then finally, asbestos would also be considered a type of particulate matter, but we'll talk about its specific impacts here. So asbestos is a long silicate particle that was previously used in insulation due to its high heat holding capacity. And so it was a really good insulator. And so we packed asbestos into insulation, as you can see here in the attic of this home. And the problem is that studies over time began to link asbestos to lung cancer and asbestosis in humans. And so this is a big problem. So it was phased out of use, but it still remains in older buildings. And so many buildings still retain this asbestos filled insulation, either in their ceilings or in their walls or even around their water heaters sometimes. Now, it's not terribly dangerous until the asbestos is disturbed or until the insulation is kind of jostled and the asbestos particles make it out into the air and then into the respiratory tract. So what this means is it's not a major threat, um, but it should be replaced to ensure that that doesn't happen. And so what we need is trained professionals to do this. So this is a really important point. You should not remove asbestos insulation yourself as a homeowner. So you need a trained professional with the proper you know, ventilation equipment, a respirator probably. Uh, they'll typically seal off the room where the asbestos filled insulation is being removed. They'll have proper ventilation, venting a lot of the air from this room outside. And so big takeaway here is that asbestos is linked to lung cancer and should be removed by trained professionals. Next, we'll talk about carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide comes from the incomplete combustion of pretty much any fuel source. And so incomplete combustion refers to when not all of the fuel source is burned. And this can be either due to lack of enough oxygen to create CO2 or low enough temperatures that don't completely combust the fuel source. So we have a little graphic here to help us remember this. We can see 
that we have a hydrocarbon being burned under low oxygen conditions, and that's going to produce carbon monoxide. Now, the problem with carbon monoxide as it relates to human health is that it causes suffocation. It's classified as an ex asphyxiant, um, meaning it causes asphyxiation or suffocation. And this is because carbon monoxide is going to bind really well with the hemoglobin in red blood cells. So we have a diagram here that can help us understand this. So on the left part of this diagram, we have a hemoglobin, and it is bound to some oxygen, and it's also going to carry carbon dioxide out of your cells. But because carbon monoxide is so good at binding to that hemoglobin, it basically displaces or kicks the oxygen molecules out of the hemoglobin, or off of the hemoglobin, I should say, and that's going to lead to a person suffocating. They're not going to get enough oxygen, and so it can be fatal. Now, in these high concentrations where it builds up, that is where this becomes really a problem. So if there's poor ventilation uh, and the carbon monoxide is not able to circulate and leave the room or leave the building, that's when it can really become a problem for humans. The other problem is that it's odorless and colorless. So you don't necessarily know that carbon monoxide is leaking into your home or being produced from a fire that you're having indoors. So in developed nations, the major source of carbon monoxide would come from your furnace, which is burning natural gas usually, and it may be releasing carbon monoxide into your home instead of outside of your home due to improper ventilation. Now you can solve this issue or you can become aware of this issue by having a carbon monoxide detector. So it's a little device that you would plug into an outlet in your home and just like your smoke detector is going to detect if there's smoke in the air, your carbon monoxide detector will detect if there's carbon monoxide and it will beep and let you know of the problem. In developing nations, sources of carbon monoxide come more from the combustion of biomass indoors. So remember that people in developing nations use more subsistence fuels, they're more likely to be having a wood fire or a charcoal fire in their home, and so that's going to produce carbon monoxide in the home, and that can be a problem if it leads up to you know, high concentrations developing in the home. Next we'll talk about vox or volatile organic compounds. So these are chemicals used in a bunch of different home products and they're going to really easily vaporize. Remember that that V in vox stands for volatile, meaning that they vaporize easily. So they easily enter the air from the products that they're used in and then they can irritate your eyes, they can inflame you know, your air passageways, so your bronchioles, or your lungs, and they can cause respiratory problems for people. So one common source would be adhesives or sealants. So oftentimes carpets or particle board or couches will use adhesives or glues in them to hold them together. And oftentimes those products will give off volatile organic compounds. Two great examples here would be, again, carpet. So the adhesives used to glue carpet down and particle board that goes into walls or ceilings or furniture a lot of times will have something called formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is commonly added to sealants and to uh, glues or adhesives, and studies have begun linking formaldehyde to cancer in humans. So it is in the process of being classified as a carcinogen, meaning that it causes cancer in humans. And so this is a problem, and this is an indoor air pollutant that we have to be aware of. When we talk about other sources, cleaners would be a really common source of volatile organic compounds. So again, think of just spraying a cleaner in your home. Think of how powerfully you smell it. And anytime you're smelling a compound really powerfully in the air, that's probably a volatile organic compound, and that's because it's volatizing so easily and entering the air so easily. Uh, and so deodorizers like Febreze would even fall into this category. And then we have plastics and fabrics. So a lot of times plastics or fabrics in your home will be treated with sealants or adhesives or other products that give them the properties that make them last a long time, and those can give off volatile organic compounds as well. Next we'll talk about an air pollutant that can be really harmful, which is radon gas. So radon gas is a radioactive gas that's given off by the decay of uranium that's naturally found in rocks underground. Now granite is a rock type that's especially known to give off radon gas. So what happens in terms of this becoming an indoor air pollutant is that cracks in your basement or in your foundation of your home can allow this radon gas that's naturally produced underground to enter your home. Then it can kind of rise up with the warm air coming from your furnace or enter your ventilation system and get dispersed throughout the home. So we have a helpful diagram here that can help us kind of visualize this. So we can see that the uranium naturally contained in these rocks first breaks down to radium and then the radium decays into radon. And then anywhere where there's a crack in your foundation or in your basement, that can allow this gas to enter your home. 
It can also seep into groundwater though. So if you have well water, you may wanna have that tested for radon and see if the radon gas is entering the groundwater source, which would then be entering your drinking water source. It's the second leading cause of cancer in the United States. And so after uh, cigarette smoking, or tobacco smoke, it is going to be the biggest cause of cancer. And so it's a carcinogen. And so it's a really problematic air pollutant that we wanna be aware of. And so what do you do to figure out if you have radon gas in your home? Well, the EPA recommends using an airborne uh, tester that will basically be a little device carried around your home and it will give off a certain noise or an indication if there is radon present in a high enough level to be dangerous to you. And so what should you do if it's detected? Well, you can prevent it from coming into your home by trying to seal the foundation. So you could use a sealant to you know, caulk up the holes basically or the cracks where air and where gas may be entering your house through your basement or your foundation. Uh, and you can establish better ventilation. So you can, if you know it's present and it is coming in through your foundation, you can try to ventilate the home better and get more of that air going outside. Uh, and so a phrase I like to remember when it comes to air pollutants, and really all pollutants, is uh, the solution to pollution is dilution. And so anytime you can increase the ventilation, uh, you're going to help decrease the health consequences of that pollutant. So the same is going to hold true for radon gas. Next we'll talk about dust and mold. So dust is a name given to fine particles that enter the air and actually a lot of dust in, in homes is dead human skin cells. So that's kind of an interesting uh, fun fact to think about next time you look at a dusty part of your house. Um, but the problem is that they enter the airways in our homes when we or our actions or our you know, air movement disrupts them. Then they can enter our respiratory tract. So if they're not trapped or filtered out by nose hairs or mucus, they can enter the bronchioles or they can get down in the lungs and cause inflammation. It can worsen asthma, worsen COPD, and so it's an air pollutant that we should be concerned about and try to limit the amount of. Next we have mold. Mold is a living organism, so it's a type of fungus, and mold is going to thrive in conditions that are wet and moist and uh, dark and not well ventilated. And so if you have an area like a leaky faucet behind your sink, and is dripping down underneath the cabinet, or your shower is leaking out underneath your linoleum or your flooring in your bathroom, those are prime places for mold to grow. So here's a picture that can help us visualize this. So it looks like someone's bathroom where it looks like a type of black mold has established itself underneath their linoleum. It's probably dripping out from their shower or from their toilet or their faucet. And so that's a problem, you wanna take care of this. And black mold is especially problematic because it's a mold type that's known to release spores into the air. So it's not just gonna stay underneath your flooring or behind your refrigerator, it's gonna release spores that can enter the air, that can enter your lungs and be really irritating and really problematic. And so what do you do to get rid of it? Well, the first step is just to spray a cleaner on the mold and actually physically wipe out the mold and remove it. And then you want to fix the problem that created the mold in the first place, which is usually a water or a moisture source that's getting trapped somewhere. And so you can try to fix the leaky faucet or the leaky shower head. You can try to ventilate the area better. So you can use a fan to dry it out. You can also maybe purchase a dehumidifier to try to keep the whole area more dry and less moist. And you know, then just staying on top of basic cleaning if the area is easy to reach. And so all of those would be solutions to try to prevent mold from establishing itself in your house. And finally, we'll wrap up our discussion of indoor air pollutants today by talking about lead. So lead was formerly used as an additive to paint prior to being phased out by the EPA in 1978. And so older homes are far more likely to contain lead paint still than newer homes. So how does it get into the human body? Well, the paint chips off the walls, especially in areas that have a lot of activity and a lot of disturbance like windowsills. And then children will oftentimes put these paint chips into their mouth. So, you know, children, of course, are curious and they like to put things in their mouth, but the paint chips also have kind of a sweet taste to it. And so it can be really problematic to have young children in a home that has lead paint in the wall still. And so it can also be inhaled as dust, though. So the lead can become attached to dust particles that then get breathed in through the air. It can enter water sources and uh, Flint has kind of become infamous for this uh, lead water crisis that happened a few years ago and while that's possible and anywhere where there's lead pipes that lead can flake off or be scraped off from the pipes and enter the water source it's a lot less common than lead paint. Lead paint is still by far the pro predominant way that lead enters uh, the human body and causes lead poisoning. And so why are we concerned about this? Well especially in children 
lead is a neurotoxicant. And so lead will damage the developing ner nervous system. It can cause uh, learning disabilities and brain development delay, especially in younger children because their bodies are smaller. And so each kind of particle of lead they inhale or that they ingest is going to be you know, more toxic to their body because it's so small. And also because their nervous system is developing. And so it's really kind of a double whammy effect um, when children are exposed to lead. So what can we do about this problem? Well, you can remove lead paint from your home and you can do this by scraping it off. You might use a heat gun and a scraper here to you know, chip away at the old paint and then safely dispose of it. You should use a vacuum cleaner to vacuum up a lot of the dust while you're doing this. And then if we're talking about lead uh, in water sources, municipalities like Flint need to go through and figure out where there are lead pipes in the ground still, dig them up and replace them with an alternative that does not contain lead. And so copper is a com common alternative and that way there's no chance that lead is going to be flaking into the water and giving people lead poisoning when they drink their water. So for practice of our Q7.5 today, I want you to take a look at this graph. What we have is in blue the number of children tested for lead. In red we have the number of children who have a confirmed blood lead level above 10 micrograms per deciliter. And if you look over on the right side, you'll see that that's expressed as a percentage of the total children tested. And then in green, we have the percentage of children who test with a blood lead level elevated above five micrograms per deciliter. So the question we have here is explain a cause for the trend in the confirmed blood lead levels above 10 micrograms per deciliter, so that's the red line, as a percentage of children tested from 1997 to 2015. 